Bad ninja in the dad. Yo. Yeah. Check, check. One, two, three, four. God damn it. Oh, hey. Bad boy. You know how we crazy. <laughs> This is Birdie, and this is Barney, and as it turns out, this is the Birdie and Barney show. Only because Wiley well, Six is his, so otherwise it would have been me. <laughs> Barney and Birdie. <laughs> no mess with the copyright, Barney, no mess with the copyright. So, uh, one of us is a long-standing uh, journalist published on Three Continents. The other is a B-licensed international uh, football coach. We, we try to let you guess which is which. And uh, today we have a special guest with us, uh, Shaka Hislop, former Toronto Tobago uh, 2006 World Cup goalkeeper, once the England Premier League's most expensive goalkeeper, and now ESPN analyst. Shaka, say hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> that song hard, boy, Shaka. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who was supposed to say hello to first. It seemed to have some. Some tension on this podcast, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Some <laughs> unresolved tension. <laughs> little little lone story, you know, Shaka, while at Redden, once almost signed for Manchester United himself. You um, know? But, I, but, Alex Ferguson made the call to, to McGee, as I recall. He wanted him as backup as Schmeichel. So, in other words, um, Shaka should be on the red side of Manchester today. Am I, am I right, Shaka? Shaka, don't answer uh, that as yet, please. Don't, don't answer that <laughs> as yet. All right, yet. okay. What what I wanna uh-huh. what I wanna say is um I've I've known Shaka since I was um probably about fourteen fifteen and I've always known his parents to be praying people so <laughs> 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 so it's obvious it's, it's obvious why he didn't end up there <laughs> proceed <laughs> how, how close were you to being a Red Devil Shaka give us his story. I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how close it was, but um, so I, I eventually left Reading in, in 95 and there was a lot of speculation about my future, and in particular around the interest um, by Kevin Keegan and, and Newcastle. Um, and with that kind of uh, rumbling in the, in the background, Sir Alex Ferguson called Mark McGee. They, they knew each other very well from... Um, I think shared time in Aberdeen um, and called Mark McGee to ask about me um, and, and, you know, express his interest uh, and get, 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 let me be know of, of Manchester United's interest. Shaka, we've had Trinidad players go abroad uh, the first year, okay. And the problem comes by year two, definitely year three, when it's time to get a new contract. You know, what's, what's the big challenge there, I think, for guys coming from these climates, essentially, and going to football in Europe in, in terms of that second, third season? Well, it's the, first of all, it's a, it's a really tough culture shock, and, and I, I experienced that, and I tell that story to this day, that um, I, I, my first contract was a, was a two-year deal. Uh, had it not been for two years, I, I wouldn't have gone back. I, I remember coming, coming back to Trinidad for, for, my, uh, for the off-season at the end of that, uh, at the end of that 93 season, 92, 93 season, and tell him my dad, I, I, I really didn't want to go back. I, I wasn't playing. I wasn't enjoying it. Um, it was tough. And my, my dad's response then was, listen, you signed a two-year contract and you you you, uh, you abide by, by your agreements. You, you, you stick to, to those promises made. So go back, see how the last year, and if at the end of that second year you still you still feel this way, well then, you know, you call it, you call it a day. And then... You look at what other, what other options you know you, you had. Keep in mind, I was still just a, a year out of university, so that was something I, I, I could have gone back and done. I went back up to England that after that that break. So so for the 93-94 season, um, got called into the to the manager's office, Mark McGee. He was there with his assistant Colin Lee, and they told me in no uncertain terms they had accepted an offer for the starting goalkeeper Steve Francis from Huddersfield. Um, and they couldn't afford to bring anybody else in. So I was the number one. I put a confidence there, Shaka. Well, I mean, that, yeah, you, you know, make, make what you want of that. You, you know what I mean? It, it was, um, it was, it was as, as blunt as that. But uh, that, that season, I played, I played every game that season. Uh, we got promoted out of the second division, what is now, what is now League One. Uh, we got promoted. And, Reading and Mark McGee and Colin Lee um, 
offered me a, a contract at the end of that uh, at the end of that season. Another two year contract. And now as the analyst for ESPN, what was the transition like? You still you still miss it? No, I I don't I don't miss playing. I miss the camaraderie of dressing rooms, but I, I don't necessarily miss playing. And and I think the reason for that is I, I just ran out of gas. You know, I I didn't have to retire because of injury, thankfully, um, or, or serious injury, thankfully. Um, I I just come to the end of my time. And the last few years of of a professional athlete's life are tough. When 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 you get to that when you get to that stage. Because you're not doing things, your body just can't do things the way that you want it to. You become uh, it, it, it doing, uh, and though mentally you, you still, you know, feel the same, physically you just can't do it anymore. And that's tough. That's tough to accept. Um, and so I struggled, I struggled with that kind of mentally for the last two or three years. And, and, and eventually I just had to... to admit to myself that you know that despite my best efforts i wasn't gonna to, to again recognize the kind of form that that i, I once enjoyed or i hold myself um i hold myself to and it was just time to call it a day um so i didn't miss i didn't miss i didn't miss playing i miss the camaraderie but then you kind of find that in a studio and, and we you know it was it was an easy transition um, coming in, working alongside Tommy Smith, Janusz Mihalik, Derek Ray, uh, who made up the ESPN Press Pass crew at the time. And you, you kind of find that camaraderie, you know, back, back with, 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 with those guys talking about the game, laughing about things outside the game. Um, and, and I always remember Tommy kind of giving me probably the best advice I've, I've had. Just be true to your opinions. Don't try to, you know, just... Don't, don't, don't try to, to bend or manipulate it to fit what somebody else might be seeing or thinking. Um, you know, and, and that's what I've, I've tried to do in ESPN. I've, I've tried to represent who I am, a small island boy who played football on, on, on one of the world's biggest stages um, and, and have a different outlook on the game in its entirety because of that. I didn't grow up thinking about joining a professional club's academy and going on to represent their first team. You know, I I grew up thinking that going to university was was the end of of my for what well, what would be the end of my footballing life, and and that that was my goals and and um, you know so I kind of I have a different outlook on the game and and I try to represent that. Well, well we have here on that, you could probably tell us um. How the move came? You were playing uh, preseason football and you were spotted somewhere. Give us that story. How you got from America to um, England in the first place? Via plane. <laughs> the, the move. The move from. The move from um, from the US to England. Yes, you were you were spotted at a preseason. Was it some sort of um, uh, competition yeah, in well, New York? Well, well, well that. Let me warn all as 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 you all <laughs> probably know. Everything, everything with me is a backstory. I, I have, <laughs> I have a long story for everything. Let me so, get, um, get comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have, go, on, go, on, make, go on, make some popcorn because we could be here for a while. <laughs> so, um, so as, so I, when, so I graduated from from university in 1992. So this is pre MLS. So that's a that's a date myself even more. But but the US had an indoor league. Um, and that the the um, summer or, or spring of, of 1992, they had what they call the senior bowl. So seniors who graduated from college go and play this indoor exhibition game for all the um, uh, indoor teams to, to come and see. It's kind of like the indoor version of, of the MLS combine now. Okay. Um, uh, thankfully, it was in Baltimore, which is just up the road from, from Washington, D.C., uh, I could afford to jump on a bus and go up to Baltimore. If it was anywhere else in 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 the U.S., I, I wouldn't have been able to afford to go. But it was in, in Baltimore, so I could I could pay for a bus to get get up there, which is what I did. So I went up. I played. I played played relatively well, I guess. Um, and then and was drafted by by the Baltimore Blast. The 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 coach at the time was Kenny Cooper Senior, who himself was a goalkeeper for Manchester United. Um, some some years before, I got drafted by the Blast, and I remember talking to Kenny and saying, "Listen, I I really want to play outdoor. I want to give outdoor a go. So don't waste a draft pick on me." 
Um, so they didn't draft me in the first round as they intended, but they did draft me in the second. And then that summer, um, the Baltimore Blast were, were going on a tour of England, or rather they were going to Birmingham to play two games against Aston Villa. Um, and their usual goalkeeper got called into the Puerto Rico national team. So they asked me to come along. I was the only goalkeeper they took, went to play two games, two indoor games against Aston Villa. Dwight had just joined Aston Villa a year or two previous. I got man in match in both games. Mm. There was a Reading scout in the stands at, at the Birmingham Indoor Arena uh, who, who saw me play. And um, they offered me a trial. And, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yes, yes. Very and, and that's a short version. That's a short version of that story. Very appreciated. Right? <laughs> 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 but Shaka, just, just um, touching back on the, the transition from playing to being a... Uh, analyst at ESPN. I always knew that you know you would gravitate to that and be a success as that at that simply because there's no there's no training, no physical training there. I don't ever remember you <laughs> <laughs> enjoying training. So all the long talk about about what your body could do and, and and your form and everything, it all came down to you didn't want to train. That 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 was it. That was it. <laughs> See? Since the you, days, since the days when um oh I forget the coach name boy when we with the U nineteen team who had you all dive in the length of the national stadium, um you since see, those yeah, days exactly you know, <laughs> I, that training I don't like that training don't make sense that training don't make any kind of sense. <laughs> Shaka, I, I listen. Go on, go, go on. Goalkeeping is about short bursts. You you work intensely for ten seconds and then you rest. Diving the line to the National Stadium never makes sense to me. <laughs> Running soundtrack never makes sense to me. <laughs> so what, what, <laughs> what, I was, what I was doing, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to skip training. I was formulating my opinions around goalkeeping. <laughs> all right, brother, all right. <laughs> Shock, you say something that really was inspiring to me just now. You, you, you spoke about the camera during the studio, and to be honest, I'm not feeling any right now in the studio, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know there's something I can look forward to on these on these Thursday events or so coming out with this fella. With this you week. know, you know, listen, you listen. know. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I've, I've, I've worked with Barney for a long time, right? But I, Barney's take a, Barney's take a while to warm up. Yada, 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 yada. Just be patient, you know. If, if if game kicking off, if the game kicking off eight o'clock, Barney had to be out there from all about six. <laughs> the thing about it is, like car. Okay. The, the, no, 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 no. The thing about it is, right? Um, you can't have camaraderie when one person, as we know, <laughs> as we know, one person is as biased as this guy could be, because uh. One minute and, and and jumping on either side of the fence. Because one minute, we want Pochettino. The next minute, <laughs> only at the wheel. <laughs> the, the guy is the worst Man U fan. I mean, Man U... I'm going to apologize now to all Man U fans. I really don't care for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, <laughs> what, what kind of apology is that? <laughs> that? That's the worst apology I ever hear in my life. <laughs> yeah, but I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll be in true. Nicole must be have a button in the house somewhere. She's a man you fan too. She's a man you fan too, right? Uh, but, uh, the point of the matter is that uh, the camaraderie will come as soon as people start to be honest about the team <laughs> and, and about well, their views. Well, while you're on that topic, Shaka, you know I understand there was a game today, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think Manchester United put out an experimental team. The hair was on the was on the bench. What do you think about Manchester United's form this season? Let's say on a scale of eight to ten. Wait, 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 Wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> Manchester United, honestly, has been a, a mixed bag this season. Um, right now, Manchester United is playing, on the, playing with the confidence of a side that, that really knows what it's supposed to be doing, but they don't. 
they've strung together a number of victories and and Chaka, as you would know when you win that becomes a habit and that becomes a feeling mm-hmm. and and you're making assumptions of Shaka there but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it gives you that extra edge and that extra 10% or 25% or whatever it is that it takes to win a game. You believe that you can't lose. You believe that if the yeah. game is at a, a, at a stalemate, there will be a chance for you to win and you could win it. And, and Manchester is feeding off of that right now. Um, from a tactical standpoint... I haven't seen anything. I've been looking at them. I haven't seen anything revolutionary. I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen set patterns that I could say, well, all right, he's doing this and he's doing that. Um, What I can say is that their players have been winning their individual battles. And in doing that, if you Mm -hmm. win enough of them, you put together things that would allow you to win a game. And that is what, that to me, is what has been happening to Manchester. Today, I, I think um, today's game, Manchester lost today's game because of two schoolboy errors. And it, it really, to me, didn't have anything to do with any great tactics or anything like that. There were two moments in the game that... Um, well, two, the two, opener was Apple Stones, literally, <laughs> John Stones. Well, <laughs> and John Stones scored with... Practically that part of the anatomy too. <laughs> but but um it was two straightforward pieces of defending to be done and and uh, that I would expect a boy playing in the SSFL to do. And and Manchester United didn't do that and they lost 2-0. Hmm. I, I I I agree to to an extent. In that, but I, I certainly feel Manchester United are playing um very good football right now and arguably the best football um in the league. That being said, looking at the game today and and just comparing it to when these two met in the league, and I remember us having a conversation, and the most amazing thing about that little draw is how Pep Guardiola set, set up mm-hmm. to to deny Manchester United. And and I thought that was that was the first priority of, of Manchester City that day, which I'd never seen Pep Guardiola do. Correct. Set his team out. To, to stop the opposition, whether, whether at City, at Bayern Munich, or at Barcelona. I'd never seen Pep Guardiola do that. And and, and that was the, the biggest surprise for me. I didn't get that feeling today from City, who themselves have found form. Uh, and, um, and and again, to, to conversations that we've had around, around the game and around City in particular, I wondered if there was a change in the philosophy around... Um, where their first line of defense starts, as opposed to as opposed to that uh, pressing at, at at the highest at the highest point of of, of the game, I, I think you see in City be prepared to sit back, drop a little deeper, and and start defending from from a little bit deeper, which maybe serves them better, um, in particular against better opposition in the Champions League. And you've seen City grow in confidence. Um, as good as, as United have been and as much praise as I've given them on the show over recent weeks, I still don't think they're the best team in the league. As much as I say they've been playing some of the best football over recent weeks, I don't think the best, they're the best team in the league. City in this kind of form, I think, are better. Liverpool in the kind of form that we know they're capable of, but has, de- has, has deserted them over recent weeks. Uh, I also believe it's a better team than, than Manchester United. But United, what we've seen from them this season, is by far and away so much better than um, than the United that we've we've seen over the last probably since the Alex Ferguson left. Yeah, the, the thing about the um and we spoke about this. The thing about the the tactical setup by City in the in the last derby, the the league game, right? League game. Um. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You could see that City were conscious of Manchester United counterattacking down the middle. So instead of playing with Two attacking and one holding, he he switched that around. Mm. One thing that I saw in games since then, um, so he did that in the United game, as we said, to, to deny the counter attack down the middle. Since then, he's made another adjustment where he's been asking, he's been playing Cancelo as a right back, but asking him to join the attack almost as a right side inside midfielder. Right. Um, 
but he's also in a position that if the play breaks down, he's there to stop it high up the pitch when they were pushing mm-hmm. high up the pitch. Against Manchester United today, he asked him to come inside, but he was almost coming inside as another holding midfielder because their line wasn't set up in the same place. I saw it against Chelsea as well. Chelsea, they played deeper, inviting Chelsea to come on to them and then looking to, to counter. So you're seeing little subtle changes by Pep. I wouldn't go so far as to say is his philosophy has changed. I think that he has been adjusting things as the, the, the league requires because people are attacking him in a certain manner. Manchester United and Chelsea were looking to play into the space beyond them and he's been setting up his team to deal with that. And you, you're mm-hmm. seeing against other teams, you will see changes as well. Um, the thing about it, as I was saying before, but I wouldn't disagree with you that Manchester United is playing well, but I am not seeing, what I'm saying is I'm not seeing set patterns. I, I could sit down and watch other teams and see it. I think they are playing well based on the players that they have. So yeah, yeah. The, the players that they have are playing, they're winning the individual battles, be it on the defensive side or the offensive side. And um, that is allowing Lasana Lybird to <laughs> be all teeth. <laughs> very little <laughs> very little of anything else Sh- Shaka let me ask you about the the, the, the tactical mind of, of Ole well, not sure the tactical or the philosophical he, he said a strange thing before the game today right and, and speaking to the um the, the commentators and so on he said that he was going to put his team out there to um just enjoy the football and I was looking behind him to see if bears were sharing out or anything like that you know I, I, I told him I said <laughs> Extraordinary before semi final. Now, you've played with some coaches, um, like Mr. Redknapp himself was always mm-hmm. one with a, a, a funny quip type thing. How much do we take out of, of, of statements to the press like that before, before games? Is, is it really possible that Manchester went out today to enjoy the football? Um, well, it, it is in that uh, it, I, I think given Manchester United's position in, in, in the league, you, you understand if, if they're gonna that's gonna be the entire focus going forward. Even, you know, so it wouldn't surprise me to hear him say to say as much, you know, before um before Europa League games is to to come, etc. That that's that's gonna be their, their primary focus. Everything else is just about, you know, let, let's go out and, and enjoy a football without without that same kind of pressure. Um but at, at the same time you know, there's a reason why you know Harry, Harry Redknapp was, without question, one of the great man managers, certainly of, of my era, and could get the best out of out of players with that kind of um, with, with, with that kind that that kind of attitude to the game. But when you when you're managing Manchester United, I think the expectation is is very different. You know, you, you, as much as you want to say, yeah, go out and and just enjoy the game and have fun and um, you don't often a, a whole lot more tactically um, in a semi-final against your, your Manchester City rivals. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, how many players really think so. How many fans want to see that kind of approach? I thought it was House of Dread going to play on Eddie Hardfield or something <laughs> for a second. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Shaka, so much changing and so much tension in the world, you know, we, we, we see today mm-hmm. some of, um, yeah, yeah, well, I wouldn't say your comrades, some of your neighbours storming Capitol Hill up in, you know. You... Not my neighbours. <laughs> 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 well, there's been a lot of talk about the, the Black Lives Matter and everything, and, and, and we see in mm-hmm. England before the games, the teams take the knee and everything else, uh, and now we're hearing, well, we've had some fans booing the, 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 yeah. the whole thing, some people saying that, okay, we, we've seen um, the knee now, uh, what comes after that? You know, it's like we, we, it's a little bit stale now. What what comes next? What what do you say? Is it important for us to, to keep to keep this uh, action going throughout the season? Does it have any sort of power behind it, or should there be a next step? I, I think it should continue, and I, I think there should be uh, there is power behind it. I also understand the other side of that argument. So one of the first teams to stop taking the knee uh, was QPR. Um, not not in the Premier League, they, they're in the Championship. Uh, keep in mind, QPR's director of football is Les Ferdinand, former teammate of mine, and the only black director of football in all of, of English English professional professional football. Um, I, I, and as it happens, I, I had the opportunity to speak to Les earlier this 
earlier uh, in the summer about about exactly that and, and why he felt that um, it had become token. And to, to his point, it it makes no sense that players take the knee. We wear the Black Lives Matter badges on our arms, and and there's no further action within football. That boards continue to to lack diversity. That the English FA continues to, to lack diversity at all its administrative and board levels. And there are no real programs in place to and to, to promote the pi pipelines of, of black players going on to, to coach, going on to, to manage uh, in, in professional sport. And that was kind of highlighted by uh, FA chairman Greg Clark and what he said uh, on, that, on that call with, with members of parliament. Um, uh, that, that highlighted exactly what Les was saying. Um, I, though, think that you need to keep having uh, these shows of support. Um, for uh, At the very least, they're conversation starters. And for us to come out, for us to really recognize significant change, we have to be prepared to have a lot of these uncomfortable conversations about race and our experiences um, in the black community of how racism continues to impact us every single day. Now, taking a knee might promote that conversation around the water cooler at work um, or the, at the dinner table at home, it might, um, it, it might Force a kid or inspire a, a kid to ask his, his parents, why are those players? Why are the players taking a knee? And have those parents explain to, to their child these issues. And I think that is empowering. And we, I, keeping in mind as well, my my role with Shuri on the red card as 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 honorary president, and the work that we do in schools and with kids. We want kids to have these discussions. We want kids to feel empowered and encouraged to have these discussions with their parents, with their teachers, with their classmates. And having this visible show is one way to start those conversations. Um, so I, I feel that's where the greatest power in, in these shows of support lies. But Chaka, is, is there a fear that, um, that other other clubs are going to go the route that QPR have gone. At at some point, at some point, uh, I guess the game will stop taking the knee, and and that doesn't mean that the game doesn't the stops stops recognizing its responsibility to equality. Um, so that doesn't that doesn't scare me. That if games this weekend, everybody stops. Everybody stops kneeling before kickoff. That doesn't bother me. What I want to see is, and I, I feel we have to continue to push for, and I think the game um, has also recognized its power and its responsibility in pushing for diversity at club boards, of, 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 of football associations. Um, even within, uh, I was also um, fortunate enough to, to interview Chris Powell, uh, who played for Charlton back in my day, who managed, who now works um, uh, in, in Gareth Southgate's backroom staff uh, and, and ha has a role with, within, within the English FA about the developing of pipelines for, uh, for black coaches. And one of the, one of the um, initiatives that they are pushing from within the FA is that uh, you, can't, you, you can't force a club as 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 much as I advocate for the Rooney Rule, the Rooney Rule is about interviews and making sure that there's diversity in your interviewing process. But what the FA are pushing for is in your academies, you have to have a certain level of diversity and representation at your under 14 and under 16 and your community levels. And that provides opportunity for black players or coaches who may not have played, but have, have gained their coaching badges, to get that necessary experience at every level of the game, to learn and provide that pipeline 
so that when jobs become available and they uh, are, are invited to, to interview, they have a body of work to show. They have that, those experiences to show. So th those are those are the things that, that will make real meaningful long term change in a way that in a way that simply kneeling and having the conversations won't. But we have to have those conversations to have that acceptance from a, a, a general public perspective. But the game has to also recognize its own its own strength uh, and its own power in driving so many of these initiatives forward. Now, Shaka, I know in America, there are a lot of um, lobby groups. You all like your lobbyists over there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like how you just pile me in. <laughs> I, I am a part of everything over here, boy. <laughs> where are you living, brother? No. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm not a lobbyist. <laughs> I am storming. I have not stormed the capital. I don't know anybody who stormed the capital. <laughs> Uh, do you know where Desha is right now, Shaka? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me get back on safe territory here. Um, in, in England, you see a benefit to, to black player groups, for instance. I mean, you, you see the Raheem Sterlings and, and the Mbappes mm -hmm. and so on making very powerful statements. But would, would we be better served if they actually had a, a group that was lobbying for their rights over there? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I think there are ways to... Um there are ways to organize um, and uh, to, to organize the, the, those and mobilize mobilize those groups. Um, without saying too much, I, I think you'll start to see the emergence of at least one group um, over over the next few months uh, around that. Um, and and again, I think that is is leaning on both the times that we're in, the urgency. Um, the urgency that that the the pandemic and and the um, equality equality protests have have highlighted, uh, and and the fact that as as you rightly point out, for oftentimes, for for so long it has been players fighting uh, their their individual battles on on behalf of on behalf of their communities, and and I think it's time that the communities also. Um, kind of come together in 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 supporting those players and and, and those initiatives. Okay, nice. Yes. And uh, another thing you have championed would be players' rights, right? Mm -hmm. And I saw today in, in the Jamaican cleaner a, a very um, strong interview, really hard hitting. <laughs> you know, and a, and a negotiation taking place between a, a young man, probably twenty four years old or something, Damian Damian Lowe, a Jamaican player, and probably yeah. three or four JFF officials, you know, t talk us through that and, and um, what really got you good there. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, first of all, Damien is a little bit older. Um, okay. I think Damien is in his, in his 30s now. Okay. But I, I remember being in exactly that position as as a part of, of you know, one of, one of the senior players within the Trinidad Tobago Football Federation was at the time and trying to have those discussions. And how how much we push to have those very same issues kind of nailed down on a longer term basis, as opposed to just showing up and, you know, you're getting, you're not quite sure when you're getting paid and each game seems to be different and each tournament seems to be different. Sets out of a four year calendar about, you know, what, what games are to come and what the compensation around that is supposed to be. Um, and then, you know, a year before the expiry of, of that of, of, of that agreement, you, you start to renegotiate. Um, and then I also recognize the tone and the language that the Jamaican football administrators were using. And, and I recognize it from our time. And it was exactly the same. And I know in speaking to a, a, a TTF official at the time that the attitudes were, you know, these are a bunch of young black boys who without football and without representing the national team, they would have nothing. And and it 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 really it, it irked me then and it continues to, to to irk me now. So even though as I was saying to somebody today, um I, I had no intention of jumping back into this free around <laughs> uh, around the politics of football, I, I just I, I I just find that Listen, I've, I've, I've lived every aspect of this game. 
And I understand how empowering this game, I understand how much this game means, how much it offers in terms of getting people out of financial hardships, in terms of just giving young men and women confidence as, as it did with me or providing a foundation for, for higher education in going off to, 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 to the US or, or elsewhere to, to pursue, p p to further their education or live out their own boyhood dreams in, in playing professionally. And to have people deny you that in a quest for their own ego-driven wants and needs to sit in the same room of power, and more specifically, white power, I, I, I feel is, is, a, is a gross disservice to this game. That's not what the game is about. That's not what I, why I played the game. So whether that gross disservice is being done by a football administrator in a foreign country or by a former teammate, if you are picking on young, poor Black people, I am going to speak out. I am going to. I am going to let my feelings be known. Who's upset as a result is inconsequential to me. Um, Shaka, you, you're upset. <laughs> 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 uh, no, but seriously, uh, uh, when I read the article this morning, you remember a message here to tell you. <laughs> I, I, I'm hearing the passion. I heard the passion in the article, and I'm hearing the passion now. Um, bringing it closer to home, how do you... Um, can you draw any parallels now with what is going on with our football and um, what you're seeing? <laughs> what you're seeing? Well, <laughs> you start really, before, really, before, before you even Before you even <laughs> finish that question, my question to you is, what is going on with our football? <laughs> Wayne just left the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, we have been, I, I can't even say we've been doggy paddling for the last 12, 12 months. You know, I, I think um, dogs are actually excellent swimmers. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've never seen that drunk dog, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no. Um, we we've missed a, a really good opportunity here. The world stood still. Mm -hmm. Football stood still, and this was our opportunity for us to to really fix our house, so to speak, get proper mm -hmm. structures in place, um, so that we can move forward. Um, from what I'm seeing so far, I'm still waiting to see that really happen. Um, I'm 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 not saying this without with with any fear. Of, of anything happening to me. I mean, that, nothing can happen to me again. The, the, door, the door is locked, Shaka. Nobody can get in right now. But um, I, I, I live in real fear for Trinidad and Tobago's football. I, uh, yeah, go, you, go, you go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry to, cut, to cut your body. I, I, I understand and I understand what you're saying. Uh, let, let me let me say this, and I, I warn you all. Everything for me has as a backstory. Uh, oh, cool. I warn you about that up front. I warn you about that up front, right? But let, let, let me just say, just to, to paint the biggest picture to this, my father went to England as part of the Windrush Generation in the sixties. Was wrongfully arrested by police, challenging Metropolitan Police. Now, a black man challenging the Metropolitan Police, mid sixties in England. Sets, sets an example of who I think we should be. That, and that, that, that was my example growing up. That's my father in my house, who, you know, that, that is, is who I aspire to be like. So the challenge that um, Tran Bigo Football found itself in with the imposition of the, of the normalization committee and FIFA's strong-handed approach um, where a lot of people felt you cannot challenge FIFA in this way, you have to back down, it's their game. That is so far from the example I have, I have grown up with. That is so far from who I know we can be, um, that I continue to advocate 
during during it all is when you see wrong happening, you have to stand up and you you again you have to make your voice be heard. Anything less than that is straight up cowardice. If my father could have done that mid sixties England, who are we to challenge power now in twenty twenty? Given the progress that the black community has made in every aspect of our life. So then, where, so then, for all this to happen, and and for me, as 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 much as as I endorsed William Wallace, I, I felt he was the best option given the candidates to live up to again what I expect or what I think football's promise is. Football's promise for me is about an uplifting of every little boy and girl who wants to play the game and an empowering of them to, to, to take this game wherever, as far as, as they may want it to be. Whether it's just forming friendships on a playground, whether it's boosting confidence, going to university or playing, playing professional or indeed playing in a World Cup. That is up to, that is up to the individual to decide but our football administration to empower. And I, I, I don't, I, I didn't think that, that well, certainly anybody else on, on who went up for elections was capable of doing that. I didn't think Richard Ferguson um, had that as his focus. David John Williams kill, clearly showed that that wasn't, wasn't his. Um, and, and in my discussions with, with William Wallace, and you know how, how strongly I feel about the secondary schools football league, uh, particularly because of how much it meant to me and my own development. So I, I had that um, I had that bond with, with William Wallace. And then to see T and then to see FIFA do as they did, again it, it spoke to it spoke to my father's own experiences and the need for us to stand up when when wrong is being done. We didn't do that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I like everybody else. I'm, I'm waiting to see the direction that our, our football goes in, but I, I don't think it'll be anything like what I believe the game should be. I think it'll be continued to serve um, the, the, the hallowed halls in, in Zurich in, in as subservient a manner as, as it always has been, um, subservient and self-serving a manner as, as it always has been. And, and that for me is, is deflating. Yeah. I mean, the, the Caribbean has, I think we could say world-class world -class athletes. From your, your your Dwight Yorks, your Usain Bolts, your Russell Atapi. I mean, Shaka Islap was pretty okay as well, pretty decent. Um, not bad. <laughs> not bad. There's How would you rate the, 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 the there's, there's structure? Shaka, there's another Shaka Islap we talking about. Well, how do we how do, how are we able to produce world class athletes and not have world class administrators, physios? Um, well, I'm afraid to say coach because. You know, you know, any uh, any be, room here, but you, you understand where I'm getting, Shaka. What, what are we missing? Yeah, be but before we get to the Sheppy bashing, right? Because that's where <laughs> you want to go down. Le let me ask you something. You you really believe when you say we producing the Caribbean? Yes. Yeah. But Trinidad, which players we produced? What what is produced? The define produce for me. We get them a jersey and put them on the field. Because Trinidad didn't produce Shaka. Mm -hmm. Trinidad didn't produce Russell Latavi. Right, mm -hmm. despite Trinidad's best efforts to do something else, well, those fellas came through. Well, as it turned out, um, Shaka, all those names are called actually funny enough in one era. So, how did you guys come to be pretty okay, Shaka? Give us a story. I, I, they knew me. I, yeah, I, I, I disagree <laughs> a little bit. I disagree with, with, with Barney, and I think, yeah, I think Tran Tobago football has to take credit for producing. Um, Russell and Dwight. And, let and, and let yeah, me ask you I, something, Shaka. Let me ask you something. You're saying Trinidad and Tobago football, right? What was the structure? Right. What we 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 both came through that. What was the structure that produced that? Well, I I I, I, th I think and, and again I continue to advocate for secondary schools football league. You know, Latas Latas could have never be as good as he was. If he didn't get to come up against you every couple of weeks and 
and and beat you to his heart content. <laughs> Russ, <laughs> what's good for Russ, his confidence? Russ, what's good for his confidence? My dude, my dude is, my dude is juggling skills against against somebody like a Wade Shepherd. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not every country have a have a bully like Wade Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> wait now, wait now, wait now. And say wait, 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 on behalf of the rest of the country, we thank you for the work you did in position. One of the greatest players we ever saw. Hey, hey, thank you, Wayne. And say, let us hold up on the Sheppy bashing, right? <laughs> but but let, me, let, let me counter that, Shaka. Dwight. Mm-hmm. Right? Dwight. Dwight didn't play against you, Wayne. Oh, uh, yeah, idiot boy. <laughs> <laughs> Can Barney still make right back at Fatima College? That would that'll probably be our our conversation for the next podcast. But go ahead, Barney. Hey. Barney, hey. no, 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 no. I know what I, you're I, going to say. I, 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 I know what, you're going to say. What are we going to say? I know, I know what you're going to say. Tell right? me. But I think, right? I, I think as as a country, you had to provide those platforms. Yeah, for, but this this is my point. Fa- this is my point. Dwight was Dwight. Dwight the Dwight played for the sec for the colleges eleven before Dwight even played for played in the colleges league. Remember that? Remember that? No, I don't remember that. But uh, no. you and I was on the same squad with that boy. Nineteen eighty six. Think Shaka got some more football no, memories no, after that. No, well, yeah, he had a lot of football. <laughs> I have to cling to these little things. You know. and, and I, have, and I, 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 actually, I remember, I remember I, that we went to and we went to Jamaica. We all played Jamaica. I, no. That was the year before. You and I didn't go anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we played Jamaica. Jamaica came and played us here. Shaka was being charitable, and, and, man. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. I have two stories for you now okay. as, as you say that, right? <laughs> Both with him. But anyhow, my point is this. Dwight was going to Scarborough, Scarborough Secondary. Right? He, they weren't in the SSFL. And Dwight was so good at 14 that he was playing with us at 18. Dwight? Oh, right. right. Dwight? No, you got 18. I, I am two years older than Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> the fight was 14 I was 16 details right? details <laughs> See, it's semantics you're going off on that I'm just saying I'm just saying All right. I'm oh. much younger than you are <laughs> you don't look it though <laughs> <laughs> where do you my point, my point is this Dwight was a product of of, of um, coach Berta St. Clair Berta correct and, 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 and Dwight's drive and everything in Tobago there wasn't any structure. There has never been any structure. Well, let me just say never. There wasn't any structure in that period that really defined that. And funny enough, though, there was more structure than there is now because we knew if we played well enough in school, you'd get selected to the North Zone or the South Zone or whatever team. If you played well enough there, you'd get co- you'd get um, called into the into the national pool for for whatever tournament is coming, and you train there. But my, right. but there wasn't any real structure for me to say, well, yeah, Trinidad has been producing these players. These players have come out of Trinidad. But I right. that, 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 that is my argument. I understand what you're saying about the SSFL. And yes, Russell and Timothy Haynes and all of these guys, yeah, they, they, they honed their art. They're scoring on Shaka Hislop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? they, they never, yeah. Russell, Russell never had any calls to come on my side of the field to deal with me and I was very grateful. <laughs> right? But yes, I understand that. We'll that, look for the footage for next week as well. Yeah. <laughs> but a, com- <laughs> a, a competition makes you, a competition is like a test at the end of a, of a, of a term. The test validates whether you have learned the things that you need to learn and the football game, the competition validates if you can carry out these, these skills that you've been working on. But that doesn't, that does not development. Development is a, uh, is, I guess, a, is a whole I, bigger thing and we have never done that. I see, I, I, know, I understand what you're saying, but I also think that, you know, you had to, you know, we've kind of learned and, and football has progressed and, and not just in Trinidad Tobago, but well, maybe not in Trinidad, but on the whole, <laughs> or understanding of, of that development um, process um, as 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 has evolved over the years and uh, around the world, you know there there are so many there are so many other examples to to exactly that of, of players who 
you know, maybe fell through the cracks and, and you, you know, you wonder how, how they were missed and, you know, Ian Wright not being even spotted till he was 23 years old. Um, you know, I, but you, you, you kind of, your, your understanding of, of that process, you learn and you have to evolve. But I, I still think, you know, I, 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 you have to take credit for, you have to take credit for producing, you know, those kinds of players, whether you put all that credit or all the credit of, of, of Dwight and his ability on Bertil or, or Russell with, with Ja Lily White or, or whoever it may be. Um, you know, that, that was that was what we understood at the time. You know, our, our understanding has grown and changed. <laughs> But I, I still think that as a country, we, we need to take some pride in that. And, and actually, I'll, I'll point one thing out. If I remember correctly, Dwight York made his first international game at 12, playing for the, the national and 14 team. So, I mean, that would also be something we should take credit for, right, uh, Shaka? Because that would right. mean that we right. were I still... Mean, I, I played with Dwight. I played with Dwight. We, it was a... Uh, um, against Venezuela or something, team, was it? It was an under-12 team... That played against we played against Venezuela under 14s. Right. And we, we got beat up bad. But that was my <laughs> first that was my first introduction to national football as well. Yeah. Right. At, yeah. at that age. So and, and, and I, I was Yeah. Right. And we have players like the yeah, Jean Paul Rushford and, and so on and Judah Garcia now and they get in their first international game at sixteen and seventeen. So that would yeah. be one thing that yeah. we were doing a little bit better. All right. And 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 that goes against and and you you highlighted the fact that we did what we knew then and the game has gone on and we our understanding is better now but we're actually doing worse yeah in terms of in terms of trying to help players you know reach their full potential well we're not even scouting in tobago anymore so we wouldn't have even if dwight was in tobago right now at 12 nobody would know about him yeah i, I think i think to, to that we is i I, I wouldn't say we're doing worse but i i feel we've stagnated when everybody else has gone forward if, if, so if you understand mm, what I'm yeah, saying, yeah. we're doing the same things now that we, that we were doing. We were doing when, you know, I was I was ten and Barney was sixteen <laughs> or seventeen. <laughs> hey, boy. I, I we're don't doing think... the same things though. No, but I... every, everybody else, everybody else has, has gone so far forward. So, uh, uh, as, as an example, and and I know that this isn't a fair comparison, just kind of given the infrastructure and, and the money. But when, when, when we were playing um, junior football, beating the U.S. was a formality. No, no, you know, they are so full, so much further ahead than us that, that you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an embarrassing comparison, mm -hmm. you know, because they've gone, but again, they have money and infrastructure, um, but we haven't done anything. We haven't done anything different in, in trying to move our football forward. All right, so Shaka, building on that, what do you think we need to do as a country to improve our football? What's the priorities? Well, I, I, my often overused cliche is a rising tide lifts all boats. And as, as I said before, um, you know, I, I think our football has a responsibility to every boy and girl who wants, who wants to play the game. Um, so to, 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 to my overused cliche, I feel we improve the best of our players by improving the worst of our players, by, by, by promoting everybody who wants to be involved in the game and giving them that platform to, to go on to the next level, whatever that next level may be. Um, and, and I just don't think we have done that. We have focused on, on who we believe are the best at the time um, and trying to keep them separate. We want to, you know, talk about an academy or a home of football that the best of our players, uh, you know, are going to live in and they're going to train here. But, you know, as, as much as we were laughing about it, you have to have you have to have people playing the game at every level. If you want to see if you want to see, to see the cream rise to the top, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you are and if you want to see those players can continue to, to develop. So the, the better you make. The better you make the average player, the better our best players become. Um, and I, I feel that need, needs to be needs to be our focus. I, I, I just feel our our our, um, our approach has been too kind of uh, tunnel visioned 
around around the, the top of, of our footballing pinnacle. Um, Shaka, the next time you walk into a conversation, walk with your own cliches, please. <laughs> I've been using that for the longest while. I don't know all, all of a sudden this is your cliche. <laughs> you, but, see, you, you see? You yeah. see? No, but but if but, you want to use my cliche, go ahead. But no, 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 all of a sudden, all of a sudden, hold on, hold on, circle all the way back. Say, oh, say oh, TM, oh, Shaka, TM. Oh, no, no, no. Trademark. So, so hold on. You, you, I'm older than you by six or seven years, based on your judgment. But, but it's your cliche. Look, son, behave yourself. Um, yeah, well, well, let's 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 remember where you went to school. Ah, <laughs> uh, boy. Now we have to go there. Right? <laughs> we have to go there. All right? It was going good. But but here, one one thing um, from from what you were saying before um, concerning concerning Dwight, you you well as as Lasana pointed out, you have a lot more football in your place. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't remember um, in that that the last trial we all the time with that SS, that college is eleven Dwight and um, Colville. When we weren't there because obviously they were in Tobago, we were training in St. Augustine and they brought them down one weekend to train and they brought Dwight yeah. and Colville onto the field, onto the, the proposed starting 11. And after 15 minutes, they took them off and I was hearing this voice behind me, Sheppy, Sheppy, when I turn around. You know that men just get picked. <laughs> <laughs> we train in here all the time, and them come for fifteen minutes, and them get picked. This real nonsense. Ooh. Yeah, well, who's that voice, boy? It's called call names, win. It might have been us. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been us. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting as you point out to uh, Shaka about the, the home of football because really Trinidad doesn't have a national youth league so it's really interesting that our national youth teams are not training we don't have a national youth league in terms of the TTFA or, or anyone mm. managing we don't really scout in Tobago so it's almost as like if they put any the cart before the horse in, in that sense you know the Wait, which, 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 we've always, which we always seem to do you know I, I, I find I, 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 so much of, of, of our approach to, to development, as, as Barney was talking about, is so bemusing. Literally, maybe, you know, you could excuse it from, you know, 40 years ago, but to, to, to know, for, 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 our, for our focus to be in a home of football, when so many other aspects of our game struggling, you know, I, I, find, that, I find that really, really ridiculous. You know, it, it's so broad and we're so far off the mark that I, I don't even think that, that we could we could cover that whole, um, the whole gambit of the thing. But the thing mm -hmm. about it is Trinidad and Tobago wants to play football like the rest of the world, but doesn't want to go through the processes that the rest of the world is going through mm -hmm. to get to that. So the rest of the world says, you know what, let us, um, let us make the coaching level, you know, let us improve the level of our coaches. Trinidad to be going out on that, right? We we, yeah. we don't want to take these steps. We want we want everybody's a Manchester City fan, a Barcelona fan, a Real Madrid fan. We want to play that type of football, playing out of the back and everything. But do we encourage our youths to do that? Have we taught them to do that? No, we can't teach them how to do that because in learning that, you're going to make plenty mistakes. And you can't be making mistakes in a U8 league with a trophy on it, as soon as you make a, a mistake, the parents on the sideline, the coaches, everybody calling on the on the, the, the little boy or the little girl to kick kick it longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All week they, they train on playing out of the back, eh? but you come in a competition where re where where is real, where you know their the standings and, and their medals and their trophies. When you go to the rest of the world, when you go to Spain and you go to these other places, they don't have competitions at that level. With, with you know at that at, age at, at that age with, yeah. with with those sort of demands they they allow the they, they allow them to play games competitive games but you can't find the standings for the u12s in 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 the uk I, but in trinidad yeah. everybody wants to be a winner and it, instead of being a better player that Correct. that, that I, is I what think, is happening i, I think one of the other things we have to do as well is and 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 in, in talking about uh, the home of football and, and, and how we compare ourselves or, or try to try to carbon copy what, what other countries are, are doing. I think that's absolutely right. I think what happened, France, um, France opened Clairefontaine, 
uh, and then win, win the World Cup in 1998. Um, and then England go on and build St. Joseph, St. George's Park for, for their national team. And we see that and think, we have to do the same. We have to copy what they're doing. And then we build, we build this home of football without ever recognizing um, how the, their, their grassroots infrastructure or the, uh, the other aspects that lead up to, to, to a Clairefontaine or, or, or St. George's Park. I thought they were going to say you're going to win the World Cup in 2026, but go ahead, sorry. I, I, the, other, the other aspect of this, and, and I, I, I like to talk about, um, I like, I like to talk about France and their approach. Uh, not, not France, excuse me, Spain and, and their. Approach. I remember mm-hmm. reading an article. This it's had to be a, a, at least ten years ago, um, where Spain, who always produced incredible talent, but no, could is. never win, could never win tournaments. Were always, were always, you know, um, flops. And then they decided, they sat down and decided, let's look at our football and figure out what our football is all about. And they said, listen, we can't compete physically with the English and the Germans. We just can't. As a people, we're not, we're not physically able to. But we produce fantastic technical players. So the philosophy becoming, we have technical players who are happy in possession of the ball. We we'll keep the ball away from the opposition. We we'll keep the ball on the floor, and this is how we play. So while a lot of people complain about tiki taka and whatnot, and it not effective enough and not penetrating enough, but that's what Spain could do. That's where the, what they were good at, and it took away the physical advantage of so many of their opponents. And this, that was the that was the kind of football that that they decided to play. What they then what they then did was. They certified as many coaches as they could at every single level of the game. You just look at, I, I get anybody to go and look at, at uh, certified coaches per capita in Spain compared with any other uh, or any other European nation. They are much higher than anybody else, in, not just in Europe, but, but in the world. And what you've seen is a continued production of incredibly talented technical players and they have a style that that is their own. In Trinidad, we don't have a we, we don't you know we we should have a style of our own. We know what kind of football our fans like, the kind of football we like to play. We like to take players on. We like exciting players down the wing. But, but we look at, at what France did. We look at what England has done, and we have kind of molded our development around what they do at the highest levels. Don't try to emulate what they do at gra- grassroots level. Haven't, disco- haven't, you know, even discussed what style is our preferred style. And as, as a result, everything is just kind of fractured and, 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 and it doesn't work. Right. And, and actually, Barney, you have been part of a, a, a group meeting just last year, right, with the TTFA Technical Committee, when they were trying to create... Uh, how, how did that go um um, a style of play. Um, well, I don't think anything like that was ever done at um, at, at a national level before. Um, the the conversation was to identify how Trinidad and Tobago. What was what made us? What made practically the same thing that you just said with Spain? I read that article too, yeah. and and it was hmm. along that same um, thought process. Um, that, however. It was a it was a good idea, but that 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 needed to be ventilated and needed a a a, a deeper conversation. However, at at least it attempted to put a structure and move us in the correct direction, which is to yeah. to universally try to play, you know, what suited us, right, and to put the things mm. in place to try to develop that. I thought. Um, Again, because of the timing um, in relation to tournaments coming up and us being the first set of teams, it wasn't practical, but it was something for a long-term roadmap to be built out on and for yeah. coaches to be, to be certified, um, not just certified, but for coaches to, to, to identify to a certain style of play. Now, I, I, I believe the, the step before that is coaches being able to teach the technique to all players that is needed 
so that when you yeah. decide and when you determine what is your style of play, the players are already, you know, outfitted with the tools needed to, to, to yeah. go into that. Mm-hmm. So it, it is something that wouldn't happen overnight, but it's something that needs a conversation, needs a roadmap. And and I think they, and I think they were going, they, they, you know, the, it, it was started. It, it obviously needed more time to go along. And that's something that wasn't going to happen in a year or two years, even it would, right. it would have taken mm-hmm. longer. Um, so that that fell by the wayside now. Um, interesting enough, though, and not wanting to you know to blow blow the trumpet of a great school. But <laughs> <laughs> Let me see but, the smoke, the smoke <laughs> on his face right now, Shaka, cringing. <laughs> but at Fatima College, um, Hayden Martin, who um, was the guy who. Um, Saved your Saint Mary's sa- College coach. Who saved yeah. your soul? Yes, he kept yes, something in, yes. in, in, he's in a the kitty. Fa- he's a Fatima student <laughs> that went to Saint Mary's <laughs> to try to save you. Let we don't go down this road. Let us we, stop we, here. We will find the product. Yeah, no, no, we will find the product. I, I am. I am not going to challenge that. Right. But for but Hayden, Martin, Hayden, I been all to the game. Yeah, Hayden, Martin. Exactly what you spoke about with Spain is exactly what Hayden Martin has gone to Fatima. And try to implement. I've listened to parents, to old boys, to a whole heap of people who sit down and watch the EPL or watch La Liga on a Sunday and try to compare schoolboys with with Ozil and 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 etc. and not understand the process. Mm. I've I've heard them say all kind of other things, but the people who know and the people who understand would appreciate what he is doing there and the results. Yeah. The results at all the youth levels, except for the top team, you know, they reflect that. And there's another reason that right. people not not um, not acknowledging for that for that lack of success there. But my point is that Hayden to me is way ahead <laughs> of the game in terms of understanding what is needed to build a football identity. And Trinidad and Tobago mm-hmm. needs to adopt that approach needs to get everybody on board so that we could all work together the same way how the Catalan coaches and the Basque coaches and, and, and the, the, the coaches in, 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 in Vigo, all of them, all, all of those coaches put aside the egos, dislikes and whatever yeah. and decided to coach all the players in Spain along the same line so that Spain could put out team, team after team playing to their strengths and nullifying their opponents. And, and we need to do something like that. And it should be easy because exactly. we are only 1.2 million and, and yep. we're the same people more or less. So we, it yeah. should be easier, but I don't know. Some went St. Mary, yep. so you can't save all. <laughs> now everybody went Fatima. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always train rocks at the throne, eh, Shaka. They always train rocks at the throne. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know what? I should bro- I, I should broaden it a little bit. Not everybody went Fatima and not everybody went Trinity. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's, ah, but it's cool up in the bush. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um well Shaka, thanks a lot for, for coming and, and spending some time talking with us tonight. Before we let you go though. You know, all, all those long years, Bernard. <laughs> all, all those young, long, long years all over the place. Tell us, uh, give us something interesting that happened to you during a professional career as a footballer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what do you have for us? Something we don't I, know. That's, uh, I, 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 need, I need more guidance on, on what, what is interesting. What, 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 do you, what do you qualify as interesting? Give us some guidance there, Barney. I can tell you what not, which story not to tell. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing about that story. Whatever story did you think about it? What, what, tell, tell us, tell us what uh, one of the, one of the funny moments in a game or something like that. Just something, in Rome or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, you, you once told me a story about Harry trying um play a, a player who wasn't happy um at West Ham, I think, with playing time, and he went to Harry and something about a sign. <laughs> oh, uh, <man. laughs> Marco Bugas, Marco Bugas. So uh, apparently, like in in Dutch, the Dutch players and and in the Dutch league, it, it's common for for the players to go and you know talk to the manager and ask why you're not playing and like they they have discussions like full on discussions, you know. But very, very in England, dumb, it, it, yeah, it, like a, a lot, you know. But I but in England, what the manager say goes right. 
So actually, this was just this was before just before I read. But the the story is Marco Bugas wasn't happy with his playing time, so he went to Harry. He went to Harry. Got in Harry office. He said, um, you know, Gaffa, I just wanted to talk to you about you know my playing time. I I, I really not getting much playing time. I wanted to talk to you about that. Harry said, come, pick it up. <laughs> they walk all the time in front of the office. Harry popped to the sign above the door. He said, what I sign say? He said, what I sign say? Marco look up. He said, manager, all I hear the door slam shut. Harry got back in the office and closed the door. Leave, leave Marco Bugas outside. <laughs> That's the end of the world is cut already. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So, uh, so with that, we, we close the door on our, our maiden episode. <laughs> the Birdie and Barney show. Anything you want to say to Toronto Tobago, Barney? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto Tobago, you're in luck. Barney, Barney still resides within our borders. He doesn't need an exemption or anything like that. You'll probably see him in the mall tomorrow or so. So, thanks again, Shaka. Thanks, everybody, listening. First episode of the Biryani Barney Show. Yeah, Shaka, thanks a lot. Good fun, man. Enjoy it. Thanks a lot for having me. More, more latter be beating me. What was stupid as I Take your props now, you help latter be correct. I help latter be correct. Good day, Toronto and Tobago. Actually, I shouldn't even say good day, Toronto and Tobago. I just say good day, everyone. Yeah, because, because of everybody yeah. This is Birdie. And this is Barney. And as it turns out, this is the Birdie and Barney Show. Uh, we're here on Wired 868, and we're going we're to be bringing football to you. One of us, a long-standing journalist, well, actually, let me cut the, I thought they were going to come in, I thought I'll answer something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I can see where I'm going to go with it. <laughs> get open for the pass, buddy, get open for the pass, what the hell? <laughs> let me see what, what the hell I want to say. <laughs> yeah, I even know what the show is about. Uh, good day, everyone. This is Birdie. And this is Barney. And as it turns out, this is the Birdie and Barney show. Uh, we're on Wired 68. We're going to be discussing football, football, and everything in between football. Which may just be football. Uh, tonight, our guest... Uh, when I say tonight... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and our guest today, former Trinidad Tobago 2006 World Cup player, once the England Premier League's most expensive goalkeeper, and now ESPN analyst, Shaka Islap. I know him, you know. He's from Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be out. I wish I could have dropped this mic, but I can't, I can't drop the mic. <laughs>